Welcome to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper, and tonight we attend a lecture given by Philip Marsh of the Pilot Connection.
Okay, this is where we begin the beginning. Well, this is a uh, 1040 instruction booklet from 1986. Okay. Way back on page 48, they have something called the Privacy Act and Paperwork Reduction Act notice. Uh, so several interesting things. First of all, right here in the bottom of the first paragraph, it says whether your response is voluntary, required to receive a benefit, or mandatory under the law. Why would the IRS, if they're so fierce as most people think, get within six miles of that word voluntary? The answer is the tax is voluntary, as you're going to see over the next few minutes. Over here it says, when you file, uh, you must give your social security number. Now, let's find out why they want your social security number. Here's a letter signed by Bill Cassardi, who is the current Social Security Administrator. And she says in the last paragraph there, to paraphrase a little bit, hey, Collins, we don't have any authority to require an employer to request a Social Security number as a condition of employment. This is between you and the employer. Well, I wonder why they have such a law, why they need the Social Security number. Let's turn over to the next page and we'll find out. Here's a letter from someone in the Social Security Administration written to this fellow in South Dakota. And it says in the first paragraph is up there that Social Security is a voluntary number. Most people didn't know that, but that is what the law states. Then around the fourth paragraph says, however, a person having no Social Security number would have no taxable income. Now, if you've ever looked at any documents you've seen from the IRS up in the upper right-hand corner, they always have a block of information. You know, say taxpayer number and your social security number. Let's show you how that works. Carl, Mr. President. Carl, suppose I said to you, how would you like to have a million dollars? And you say, who do I have to kill? Well, nobody, just sign this piece of paper. And uh, you look at it and it's blank, right? So that seems agreeable to you, so you go ahead and sign the paper and give you the million dollars. Three days later, I come around and say, where's your wife? And you say, what do you mean, where's my wife? Well, you sold it to me three days ago for a million dollars. You said, I did like hell. I signed a blank piece of paper. Now, whip out the paper and say, is your signature? Of course it is. And type right in above there is that you sold me your wife three days ago for a million dollars and today's the day I collect. That is what's known as fraud and inducement. In other words, I didn't tell you the whole truth up front. When they told you that you had to have a social security number to go to work, that was a ball face lie, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When they told you Social Security was going to take care of you in your old age, that was another ball face lie. People who are drawing Social Security today can't even afford dog food anymore. It's too expensive. That bad. And so it doesn't take care of you. But what did it do? Made you a taxpayer the rest of your life. That's fraud. There is a very solid law that says fraud vitiates the most solemn promise to pay. So. When they defrauded you, they also cut their own throat. Let's look at 1988 1040 instruction book. Then. We'll find something interesting. The Privacy Act has been moved from page 48 up to page 1. And in 1989, same story. I wonder why. The answer is that they've been caught with their hand in a cookie jar. And their only defense is, we told you it's voluntary. <laughs> this is an official IRS publication, and beat up as it is, we do have nice new copies of it. <laughs> but I use this one because it proves the point. That is, I've been doing this for eight years. Mm-hmm. And it looks at least eight years old. Yeah. Uh, it's called the Illegal Tax Protester Training. This is an instruction book for IRS agents, okay? And what's your first name? Ryan. Ryan? Ryan, you want to tell us what it says right there? Do you see United States there? The word United States? No. Uh, so they're not. The Department of the Treasury of R.E. Harrington Incorporated, a private English insurance company. We're going to be showing you their incorporation papers before the day's out. And uh, if they told you that up here, obviously you wouldn't talk out to them, right? Carl, let's see what their official position is here. 
start with the word these and tell us what that one sentence says. These individuals and groups are attempting to disrupt effective tax administration present a major danger to our voluntary compliance. Did I say voluntary or did the IRS? Yeah. <clears throat> what is an illegal tax protester? They say it's somebody who fills out a return and doesn't pay all the taxes for whatever reason. I even happen to agree with them on that. If I sign you up to play football for 49ers and you come out in your Oakland A's uniform with all the baseball rules in your head, we're going to have a problem, right? Yeah. All right, if you and I sit down and play Monopoly and you want to insist on playing by general army rules, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> So, yeah, if you're going to file tax returns, play by the rules. The people in here did not play by the rules. They used excuses like vow uh, poverty through church, uh, didn't want to pay for abortions, didn't want to pay for you know, military, all this kind of stuff. And they just didn't pay all their taxes. That's not fair. That's not playing the game by the rules. And I don't blame the IRS for being unhappy about that. Okay? <laughs> or anybody else for that matter. Whatever you do, you play by the rules, right? Now, uh, Ronnie, I have some real bad news for you. Did you know that there's a law against wearing washed blue jeans in San Jose on a Wednesday morning? You didn't know that. Yeah. Supposing I showed it to you in a legal law book, however, and it was written there. Would I have to threaten, force, or coerce you, or would you simply know you broke the law? I probably know I broke it. Right. No. My point, that's a silly point, but the point is to emphasize this next thing we're coming to. This is instructions to the IRS agents, and it's about stop filers and non filers. This is the place to tell them what law a person is breaking by stopping filing or not filing. Now, you want to see those three paragraphs for us and tell us what law we're breaking here? These teams are all individuals who have never filed an income tax return and simply stop filing. These protesters are the most difficult to identify since they do not draw attention to themselves by sending in protest letters and not acceptable returns. In some areas of the country, stop filers and non filers are becoming more common. Many Maryland illegal tax protesters just have stopped filing any kind of return. Unless the individual is known to the service employee, it is extremely difficult to determine if the taxpayer is an illegal tax protester. Uh, I know that your name's Ronnie, I know you got blonde hair, a purple sweater, blue jeans, and uh, athletic shoes on, okay? Is there any law against any of that? Mm. Not that I'm aware of. So it was known to someone in the service. So what? What law are they breaking? If you're breaking a law, that's a whole different ballgame. Uh, Carl, it says you're questioning your authority. You want to read just that first line for us? Question your authority. Identify yourself by showing your credentials. State the appropriate authority. IRC. Okay, IRC 6331 to levy and seize. That's and right. IRC 7602 to examine both of Yeah. So they're telling them that IRC 6331 is their power to levy, right? Uh, IRC is in the revenue code. Well, let's get into section 6331 and see what it says. Right. Again, this is an eight-year-old book, but the new ones say exactly the same thing. Tell me where Levy gets that one sentence for us. Levy day may day upon the accrued salary or wages of any officer, employee, or elected official of the United States of the district of Columbia or any agency or instrument employees in the United States of Columbia. Mm-hmm. That's how I like you. That's the example of the government. It's the government employees, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, there's a little bit of history you need to know here before we get into the rest of this book. First of all, back in 1775, they had 13 colonies in this country. Okay? And these colonies banded together for the common defense and so forth. First with the Confederation, which didn't work too hot, and then with the Constitution, which meant that each colony gave up a little bit of its jurisdiction to form this small central federal government, which was empowered, the federal government was empowered to provide for the common defense, nothing wrong with that, to try people for treason, nothing wrong with that, to try people for piracy on the high seas, nothing wrong with that, to try them for counterfeiting, nothing wrong with that. But that's all the power they were given. Now, to make sure that uh, the 
federal government wasn't influenced by one of the states unduly, rather than have them have their sheet of government in a state, they decided to get their own property, which they could control. So they gave them Washington, D.C. Okay. Now, I want to get this jurisdiction thing clear in your head. Yeah. Carl, you own a car, right? Mm -hmm. Supposing, uh, and do you have jurisdiction over that car? Control? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Supposing you were kind enough to lend me your car to go to the grocery store and back. Who would have jurisdiction over that car while it's going back to the grocery store? You would. Yeah. And when I gave you the car back, you still have a majority jurisdiction, right? So that's what the states did. They gave up a little bit of their jurisdiction to this small central federal government for these purposes that I just mentioned. And no more. Now, my next question is this. Where in the heck does this small central federal government get off coming in here and telling the citizens of the state of California that owe them any taxes? Ridiculous on its face. Let alone highly illegal. Okay? Yeah. And the only way they even attempt to attach anything is through what we call color of law. Okay? Policemen wear blue shirts. I'm wearing a blue shirt, therefore you better do what I tell you. Okay? I didn't say I was a policeman today, <laughs> but that's color of law. That was almost law, but not quite. Okay. okay. Uh, Another thing you need to know before we get into this next section is about sedition by syntax. Sedition means stealing government power under the table, surreptitiously, not openly with military force, okay? And how do they do this? By syntax. What is syntax? That means making you believe all your life that a word means something, and then turning around and giving it a legal definition that means something entirely different. So that when you read that word, you think you know what you're reading. But you're not reading what you think you're reading. Now, I'll give you an example of that where it confuse you. Carl, can you tell me what a driver is? A driver? Mm -hmm. The person who drives an automobile. Mm -hmm. I mean, the state of California even agrees with you. In the Motor Vehicle Code, it says a driver is one who drives. In section 305. Now, my fifth grade English teacher told me never to define a word with a word. So I was curious to know what the heck is a driver? So I went to Black's Law Dictionary, which is the dictionary that the legal eagles use when they make up these definitions. And it says in there that a driver is one who operates a motor coach and a whole bunch of stuff. Whether you're employed by himself or employed by the owner. Employed? Come on, that's commercial, isn't it? All right. Then, if you look at the Motor Vehicle Code carefully, you'll see it's constantly referring to the Uniform Commercial Code. The business and professional codes, the revenue and taxation codes, all of which are commercial in nature, totally. So I went to the revenue and taxation codes, and in section 9303, I found something very interesting. Operator includes somebody who hauls passengers of freight on the highway for hire. But 9303.3, operator excludes someone who hauls passengers on the freight or freight on the highway as long as it's not for hire. That's me. So I am not an operator. It also tells me in there that an operator has to pay 3% of his gross receipts. It also tells me an operator has to have a driver's license. I even agree with that one. But I'm not an operator, and I don't need a driver's license. Okay. That's the big argument I got with the state right now, all those court cases are all over that issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm winning it, believe it or not. So anyway, uh, that's sedition by syntax. See how it operates. Uh, in 1938, when Congress was allegedly putting this piece of garbage together, and I use the word allegedly for this reason, I wrote a book. Uh, I know everything that's in the book because I had to edit it several times. I've lectured on it and worked with it constantly. And so I know everything that's in that book. Okay? Call up your congressman today, your senator or representative, and ask him what is contained in the Tax Reform Act of 1986 which they allegedly wrote. And you know what they'll tell you? We'll be happy to send you a copy. But that's all you get out of them. But they don't know what's in it. They don't understand it. And the reason is they didn't write it. The IRS's attorneys wrote it. Congress just rubber-stamped it. Highly illegal, to put it mildly. Okay. Uh, in 1938, when they allegedly wrote this piece of garbage, the entire debate was about taxing government employees. And I have a copy of those debates there in my files. But 
it's not necessary to dig into all that to find out because they were kind enough to tell us right here or an employee you want to tell us the 3401C employee for purpose of this chapter the term employee includes an officer employer or elected official of the United States a state or political subdivision thereof or the District of Columbia or any agency or instrumentality of any one or more of the foregoing the term employee also includes an officer of a corporation mm-hmm. okay first of all and you all lie, all your life you probably thought you were an employee or had employees or whatever. It's not true. An employee by definition here, somebody works for the government, isn't it? It goes on to say state, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So if somebody works for California would think, whoops, they got me. No, again, tradition by syntax. Section thirty one twenty one E in here says state includes Puerto Rico, Guam, the Marianas and Washington D C. And or government enclave. Now, government enclave is, for an example, the federal building in San Francisco or Moffett Field or uh, Presidio, Alameda Naval Air Station, this kind of thing, which you've got all across the country. If you own property, and you can own more property more than one place, right? You can have a house on the seashore and a house in the mountains or whatever. So you would have jurisdiction over those, and naturally the federal government has jurisdiction over what they own, period. But, uh, they're trying to make the bluff here with the word state and another place they even use it is the officer of a corporation right so you think well gee I'm officer I'm president of my little corporation so that means me no what are these these are federal regulations aren't they they apply to federally chartered corporations of which there's only one that we're aware of and that's the Federal Reserve Bank so if you're an officer of the Federal Reserve Bank it means you otherwise forget it Incorporated by state. Uh, every other incorporation, corporation in the country is in a state. Right. Okay. Also, if you recall up the IRS right now, say, where is it written and I have to file a tax return? We're going to quote you section 6012. This is the general rule there, the first two lines. Every individual having a taxable return. No, no, no. General rule. Return okay. Specific. Returns with respect to income taxes under subtitle A shall be made by the following. Okay. Do you say income tax returns? So returns with respect to income taxes, isn't it? Why is strange wording? Supposing right, you're a high power government employee and I'm the government and I'm paying you a big fat salary and I want a return with respect to income taxes. Now the wording makes a little sense, doesn't it? Because that's what applies to nobody else. You go down and say, I didn't understand that. It doesn't say income tax returns. It talks about returns with respect to income taxes. Okay. So if you're a government employee and I'm the government and I'm giving you a big fat salary and I want a return with respect to income taxes, this wording makes a little bit of sense. Okay. It's not too clear, but it does make more sense. And talking, if, if we're talking about income tax returns, then you can say, well, that's what I file and so forth, right? But that's not what we're talking about. Everything the IRS has and does, as you will see, is almost, you know, color of law, almost on, but not quite. It doesn't really apply to you anywhere else. But they're using it to tell you that it does. That's just a ball face lies, fraud. Okay? And it goes on to say under subtitle A. Well, if you look up subtitle A, which is in the other book of the code, it talks about income taxes. And the minute you see the title, hey, yeah, huh. Yeah. But there's something about the IRS code. Every time that you pick up any the book at any particular paragraph, it will refer you to somewhere else in the book. And by the time you finish, you will read the whole book and be thoroughly and completely confused. Okay. But subtitle A, as you're reading down, it all of a sudden dumps you into subtitle E. Subtitle E covers people who deal in alcohol, firearms, and tobacco taxes. Those are the people that are required to follow because they're volunteering into a regulated enterprise. And so naturally, they're required to file tax return. And it goes on to say, shall be made by the following. Now, a lot of people think shall means you've got to do it. Uh, United States Supreme Court and every other public court in this land has ruled in over 61 case sites that I'm aware of, that the word shall, when used in any law or statute outside the Constitution, which of course this thing is, means man is voluntary. Okay. So again, it's tradition by syntax, right? Anyone could be must. Okay. <clears throat> there is one person who is required to file. Can anyone tell us who it is? Guys, it's underlined there. A non-resident alien individual. Right. And I even agree with the IRS on that one. Now, those of an alien coming here, this means that they're they're not planning on moving here. They still have a home in France or Germany or wherever they came from. 
And uh, the least they're going to do is use up some of our food and might use up some other natural resources. And they may even make a few bucks and they leave. So tax them. I have no argument with that. But at this point, we need to understand the difference between taxes and tribute. Have either one of you read the United States Constitution since grammar school or even at that time? No. Uh, see, only one person in a thousand has. And that's what the problem is in this country today. And the reason it's a problem is this. The first three words of the Constitution are we the people. The last three words in the Tenth Amendment, which is the last legal amendment in the Constitution, are to the people. Whose document is it? We the people's document. And we the people don't even know what it says. How are we going to enforce it without even reading it? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But you remember, this is all planned deliberately to get you to not read the Constitution. They talk about it, you know, you hear about it in the press and all this kind of stuff. But to you, it's just a vague name, and you think it's okay, and you want to go on about your business or raising your kids and making a living or whatever it is you're doing, not paying much attention. Well, when you do that kind of stuff, friends, the fox steals the chicken out of the hen house because you put him out there to guard. And that's what the problem is. So we will, before we're through here, show you the Constitution and get you to read the thing. Uh, one of the things they also tell you is that you must obey the law, right? Um, and we'll do the honors on this 7806B. Arrangement of prosecution. No interference, application, implication, or presumption of legislative construction shall be drawn or made by reason of the location or grouping of any particular section or provision or portion of this title. Nor shall any table of contents, table of gross references, or similar outline, analysis, or descriptive matter relating to the contents of this title be given any legal effect. That's fine. Uh, did you clearly understand what you just read? <laughs> no idea. Yeah, good. Because <laughs> if you said you understood it, I couldn't do business with you. have to be insane. <laughs> there is a law. It says when a law is vague, it's null and void for vagueness. But they're trying to hide something here. Did you see the words descriptive matter? Did you read? And going on saying no legal effect? Well, descriptive matter, according to Black Law Dictionary, is the entire book. Has no legal effect. It's true. It's administrative regulations applying only to government employees, and it's voluntary even for them. I have a, a worker here. Not an employee, she's a worker. And I have administrative regulations. Mine are very simple. Come to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, get an hour for lunch, go on the floor. Okay. But she still has regulations. It's just fall. Okay. It's true with any company. Got to have some kind of rule. Otherwise, it's not going chaos. You're listening to an introductory tax seminar given by Philip Marsh of the Pilot Connection on the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Make sure you get a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper and be ready to write down the information that you'll need to be able to attend one of these seminars or obtain information about the Pilot Connection. Right now, we're going to take a short break, folks. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. I want you to write this down. The Pilot Connection. That is the Pilot Connection. Six... Three, 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 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207. That's the Pilot Connection, 6333, three, three, Pacific Avenue, Suite 334. Stockton, California, 95207. Now, you can also phone them. And here's the number. Area code 209-957-5493. That's area code 209 Five seven five four nine three. 
Now, this information will be repeated later in the program. Remember, whether you write or phone, make sure that you tell them that you heard about them on the hour of the time and that William Cooper sent you to talk to them. Now we return to the second half of the tax seminar conducted with Philip Marsh of the Pilot Connection. So the government's entitled to have rules for its employees, but what they're not entitled to do is to shove those rules down your throat when you don't work for it. And you know, their only claim to fame, as far as you're concerned, is the fact that they've suckered you into the Social Security situ- situation. And it's total flaws from top to bottom. Carl, you want to tell us what it says right here in this block? That's an official IRS publication. Yes, sir, our tax system is based on individual self-assessment and voluntary compliance. The material contained in this handbook is confidential in character. It must not under any circumstance be made available to persons outside this service. National Revenue Service Commission. Uh-huh. Why do you think they don't want you to know what's in here? What's the one thing that people dread more than anything else with the IRS? The audit, am I right? Mm-hmm. Well, would you tell us what the official position is? Just the first sentence there. The individual there. taxpayer may refuse to exhibit his or her books or records for that's examination. Right, that's right. What did you just tell me? You can refuse to exhibit them, right? Right. If you can refuse, what is the tax? Voluntary, isn't it? Right. Are you folks in business or self I mean, yeah. self employed? Yeah. Then you need to know about this also. This is the IRS's strategic plan. Mm-hmm. This is a five-year plan. Have you ever heard that term before? Yeah, communism. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So isn't it nice to know that we're socialistic in the country now that we're entitled to a five-year plan, see? And this thing started in May of 1984, so it was supposed to have been finished in May of last year. Mm-hmm. However, the IRS is a bunch of pluses, and they haven't quite made the grade yet, but they're working year on it. Huh? Probably at year one. <laughs> Now, you want to tell us what the first sentence says right here? Tax compliance among self-employed and persons is low in relation to other groups of taxpayers. Okay. Carl, what's it say right here? First sentence. The largest part of the tax gap from legal activities is represented by taxes due on unreported income of non-farm businesses. Mm-hmm. Are you a non-farm business? Uh, why don't you care about farm businesses? The answer is real simple. They know every blade of grass that a farmer raises and every one he cuts because they watch them all the time. Like the story about the farmer that was on his property and the government agent came up to him and he says, Mr. Farmer, he says, I'm with the government. He says, I want to inspect your farm. The farmer said, get the hell out of here. He says, I've been here 45 years. I've never had a government agent on my property and it's not going to happen today. The government agent kept on getting more and more pushy and officious and finally brought out his business card and the farmer decided... Yeah, it's not worth arguing with him. Go ahead. So he went on about his business. About an hour later, he hears, help, help. And he looks up. There comes this government agent running across the pasture, held up the leather of the old bull about that far behind him, you know, screaming, help, help. And the farmer says, show him your business card. <laughs> but the fact is that uh, the... Uh, the government is interfering far too much in too many areas of our lives today. Now, we have shown you that the tax is voluntary. And if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer in just one minute after I show you this. In order to tell you what we can do about your specific problem, okay, before we ask you any questions about it, the first step we have to do is get ourselves protected and you. Uh, if I do business with the general public, I have to be licensed as a CPA and an attorney and whatever else they decide to do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But there is another law that says that within the confines of a First Amendment association, we can do anything short of murder and get away with it. And so we ask you to join this First Amendment association, the Pilot Connection Society. It costs $45 a year, covers husband, wife, men, married children, and their 18 living home and working. And what you get for this is the ability to discuss your problems specifically, plus a very, very valuable newsletter. It's going to give you all kinds of great information about how to run your financial affairs as well as information about what the government's up to and this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll put that aside for a moment. Uh, any questions on what we've shown you so far? Okay. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is show you the documents we use to fight them with. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And then tell me how much it costs. And after that, if you want to proceed, then the next step is you know, to join Freedom Price Society and go on. First thing we're going to do, if you have a problem, is we're going to write your cover letter. Now, this is what I call a position letter. That means that you're saying, you did this to me, I want this for redress. Okay? Mm -hmm. It may have uh, exhibits, it may not, depending on whatever. Uh, we do recommend that you handwrite this letter because it takes three to five times as long to read handwritten material as it does type. Anything to slow those turkeys down. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, this letter is not cast in concrete. In other words, you can add or subtract from what we suggest to suit your own needs. Next thing we're going to give you is another cover letter, which also should be handwritten, but this one is cast in concrete. In other words, you have to use exact wording that we use here. And it starts off by saying, I studied law and find I learned of the jurisdiction or agency. And to paraphrase it a little bit, says, if you have any information to the contrary, I want it signed in writing under penalty of perjury. And if you go around, it, around this demand, I'm going to sue you under Section 7214 of the IRS Code, which is quite crystal clear that when an IRS revenue agent uses cover of law to extract uh, taxes from someone, he becomes personally liable. He can get uh, $10,000 fine and five years in jail for doing that, plus be discharged from his job. The next thing we're going to hit with is an official demand for jurisdiction. Uh, this requires your name and address here. This whole, whole thing has to be retyped. You send it to the IRS's local office as well as, like Fresno, for example, the, the regional office. And the reason for that is that they like to play football with you. If the local office is after you and you push them out of the picture, then they chase Fresno after you. But if you get them both at the same time, you probably never hear from them again, which is what you want, of course. Yeah. Then the date and certified mail return receipt requested. You sign it here and you get a proof of service signed by this interested third party. That's real important because if you don't, every time they'll say, yeah, we got your envelope. They have to. They got their receipt. They send their receipt back. But what you said was in there, well, then <laughs> so you got this, you said, hold it, I got a witness. Then they never question it. So you use like a notary? For no, uh, not for this. This is uh, just a friend, okay? Anybody but the two of you. Yep. Okay. Also, you need to retype this. This is a memorandum of points of law. Anytime you do anything legal like this, you have to have some kind of law backing you up. Okay, and sign that. This is probably the most important document that we have in our bag of tricks. The only law in here that the IRS can charge you with is Section 7203, willful failure to file. There's only one way that they can prove willful failure to file. And that is to bring in your in your old tax returns from 19 whatever, and say, look, Your Honor, he knew he was a taxpayer. Here's his old returns. Now he isn't filing. And the judge would look at that and say, guilty. And you would pipe up and say, hold it, Your Honor. I found out there's fraud involved here. Fraud vitiates the most solemn promise to pay. So I revoked my signature on all those documents. And just let me see that thing. And it took. Case dismissed. Now, the IRS knows this, and this is why, in the over 8,000 cases that I've handled in the past eight years, they've never, ever taken one of my people anywhere near a courtroom because they all file this up front. And that means that there's documentary evidence that you were a taxpayer. They're blown right out of the water. Okay? Now, here comes the biggie for most people. <clears throat> this is revocation of your bank account, checking, savings, and bank credit cards. And the reason for that is this. There was a little card, about yay big, yellow or white, called a signature card that you signed when you opened that account. Mm -hmm. And right above where you signed your name, there was a little paragraph of fine print that said, in effect, I agree to abide by all the bank's rules and regulations and all the rules and regulations of the Federal Reserve System. One guy has said, I couldn't find the Federal Reserve System on that thing. I went to the bank and looked at it. And I said, yeah, but it did say the bank's regulations. He said, oh, yes. Yeah, well, really, thanks, regulations, not a Federal Reserve regulation. So if they want to play games with you and hide it, but they're still, you're still signing a contract, unbeknownst to you. They're, they're telling you that it's just your signature card so they can check your signature on your checks that come in so nobody can forge you. That's a lie. It's an adhesion contract. And what it does is this. The first step is, if you ask them to see those regulations, you know what they show you? The door. Because they know if you read the regulations, you wouldn't do business with them. Uh, one of the uh, regulations is that the instant that you put that money on a teller's cage, that it belongs to the bank and not you. What did you just do? 
You're doing business with the Federal Reserve Bank, aren't you? Who's the IRS? Collection arm for the Federal Reserve Bank. You just gave them written permission to clean out your checking account any time you want to. But they didn't tell you that. And you didn't know it. Or maybe you had your checking account cleaned out. Okay? All right. Uh, the other thing is that you put yourself under Admiralty Maritime Law, which is the worst place you can be. There are two basic kinds of law. One is the common law, which belongs on the land, and the other is the Admiralty Maritime, which belongs on the sea. Now, Admiralty Maritime is nasty law. If you have a ship here at point A, and you have a captain, you give him a commission to get that ship to point B. And you're on the crew, and out here in the middle, somewhere in the voyage, the captain does something immoral, illegal, crazy, whatever. And you're going to argue with him, and that argument can cause the ship to divert its course. He has the right to kill you, throw you in irons, or throw you overboard. And when he gets over here, he doesn't have to pay any penalty for doing that, because his commission is to get the ship from point A to point B, regardless of what it takes. Okay. When you are in an Admiralty Maritime Court, the judge is like the captain of the ship. He has the last word, and as always, you lose Turkey, no matter what your arguments are. So that's what you agreed to when you pick out your check in your savings account. Now, do you want to keep it? Or would you like to get rid of it? Yeah. All right. You wrote your signature on it. So you give this to your bank? Yeah. Will your bank cancel your checking? Account? Well, we show you how to do the whole thing. Oh. Okay. Uh, and there are four alternative methods of banking. As a matter of fact, we have five now, actually. Maybe we just got a new one. So, there are five ways of doing banking without having that signature card floating out there destroying you. Okay. And uh, obviously, you have to do that. It's one of the major things. We just had a chiropractor from Ukiah that was convicted last month of willful failure to file. I had nothing to do with his case. I tried to help him, but he's, he's using somebody else to help him. Uh, but at any rate, uh, he, he did tell me that all during his trial, the U.S. Attorney kept bringing it up over and over and over. But, Your Honor, he has a checking account. So that was her main argument. Got to go. <laughs> Next document is real interesting. Uh, this is provided for in the Freedom of Information Act which is a very valuable act to us. That's how we got a couple of these books that we have here. And uh, this is a Privacy Act request underneath the Freedom of Information Act, like the sub-chapter. And in this first paragraph, you're going to ask for your IMF or individual master file for the year or years that they're after you for. Now, the IMF comes back, and you can read your name and address on it, and all the rest of it's in computer code. But we have the books to interpret those codes. And what happens is that uh, we've never seen an IMF that doesn't have two interesting things on it. One is an MF-06, which means no tax return was due for that year. And an MF-10, which means no tax was due for that year. How are they going to look if they try to take you to court and you've got this document? At least the judge is going to have some questions about why are they in here telling you you owe them $10,000 or whatever it is when the IMF shows you don't owe them anything. Now, why doesn't the IMF show that you owe anything? The answer is real simple, folks. The IRS doesn't collect taxes. They collect tribute. Do you know the difference? Okay. The reason you don't know the difference is because of the question that I asked you earlier, whether you've read the Constitution or not. If you've read the Constitution, you know what taxes are. The duties, imposts, and excises. The duty is tax on foreign goods coming into this country. Or well, we don't got enough of that stuff in our homes these days. We can't afford it. An impost, they say, is a tax on a corporation. Uh, it's a tax, an indirect tax on the people who do business with the corporation. The corporation starts out for zero money. They raise money by selling goods or services to the public. So what are they going to do if there's a tax? They're going to pass it on to their customers, right? That's where that comes down. The third one is excise taxes. That's the biggie. And again, most people aren't aware of them. We're all wearing shoes. There's 618 excise taxes on a pair of shoes. You ever go to and buy a loaf of bread, right? Mm -hmm. There's 108 excise taxes on a loaf of bread. Did you ever put gas in your car? Go. Almost daily. Yeah. 83% of the cost of a gallon of gasoline goes to state and federal excise taxes. 
milk, cigarettes, booze. The list goes on and on. Okay. The government raises twice as much money as it needs to run the government legitimately. If they just stop paying two thousand dollars for hammer and pay seven ninety five like the rest of us through those methods. So that was the question, where's the IRS come in? Well here's where the IRS comes in. They steal your money in the form of tribute because you're getting nothing for your money for tribute. Okay? So I came to you and call and said, Carl, give me a thousand dollars now. And you say, Why? And I say, Because my name's Philip Marsh. And you say, well, what are you going to do for me for my thousand dollars, Philip Marsh? And I say, absolutely nothing. I want the thousand. Pay now. I might as well have a gun on you and steal your wallet, right? Same difference. That's exactly what the IRS is doing to you. The treasurer of any organization is the one who receives the money and pays the bills, right? That's what mm -hmm. the treasurer's job is. Who pays the United States bills? Look at any government check. It says United States Treasury Department on it, right? Not Treasury Department, United States Treasury Department. Look at the back of any check you've ever given the IRS. Deposit to the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, who's the Federal Reserve Bank? They are a private corporation owned by one American family and 11 foreign families. Okay. Who in their entire history, since 1913, have never ever given the United States Treasury one dime. So where's the money going? The answer is, it goes to Russia, China, and other communist activities designed to destroy this country. Now, when most people hear that, they say, wait a minute, this guy's off the wall and out for lunch. Couldn't possibly be right. Can't possibly know what he's talking about. So let's look at a few facts. First of all, one time on this planet, there was nothing but masters and slaves. And one day a slave broke free and decided he didn't have to be a slave anymore, and he became middle class. Middle class, by definition, is somebody with money and education. They're free to travel about, and they make lousy slaves. You know, you got a slave, you want to know where they are all the time. Okay? That's step one. Step two is this. Oh, uh, maybe I should expand that, that there is still the master mentality on this planet. It would be so lovely if we could get rid of it. There are 12 families known as the Order, and they run the world. And you've never heard of them, because they run it from behind closed doors. They just pull the strings. And people like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds who are up front for them dance the tune. Okay? But the Russells and the Millers and the Bushes and these are the families that run the rule of the world. Yes, George Bush is one of them. Okay. You know who the head of the drug war is in this country, according to the press? George Bush, right? Oh, yeah. You know that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know who the chief drug pusher is in this country? Same guy. Same guy. Yeah. That's why we we'll never win the drug war. Drug war is being used to take our rights away from us. In fact, I'm working on a case right now we just heard about yesterday where the police broke into this woman's house only in half uniforms. They weren't fully dressed or anything. And they were full uniforms with guns drawn and everything. Put a gun in the face of a 10 year old. Fighting them out of his wits and everything else. They opened for drugs. Turned out later they had the wrong address. And when the woman tried to get an attorney to defend her on it, the attorney said, it'll cost you more for the case than you know to get out of it. Which is how much. They're, they're coming up for each other. But where did that come from? It came from the fact that recently the Supreme Court said, in the case of suspected drug dealers, police don't have to have a warrant to break in and search. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was our special guest tonight via tape, Bill Marsh from The Pilot Connection. I'm doing it because you need to know the truth. You need to know what's destroying this country, why we've had rampant inflation, why our money has been debased, why a dollar is not a dollar and a quarter is nothing more than a bus token, why these so-called government agencies are not government agencies at all, but are private corporations destroying this country, owned and operated by the Illuminati. The Federal Reserve is one of those private corporations and the majority of the stockholders are not even United States citizens. It is the biggest heist in the history of the world as you heard on an earlier episode of the Hour of the Time from my own research. Here you heard it from the point of view of the income tax from Phil Marsh of the Pilot Connection. 
the IRS, is the collection agency for the Federal Reserve. After they rip us off by loaning us money in the form of credit that didn't even exist in the first place, and charge us exorbitant interest, someone has to collect that. And the process creates inflation consistently over the years. The only way that they can consistently fool the people into accepting it is to blame the inflation on something else, such as the price of oil, and collect the taxes to take out of the country so that the American people will never catch on to the rampant inflation. The money goes to fund the communist nations and other organizations which has as its goal the destruction of not only the United States but the sovereignty of all nations and the creation of a one world totalitarian socialist government. Wake up America, you've been had. In his book, Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn made the statement that if the Russian people had banded together in their homes at night collecting whatever weapons they could, such as pitchforks, sticks, and bricks, and kill the police when they raided their homes, there would have been no police state in Russia. With the IRS SWAT team raids on private homes becoming a more and more frequent act, it is apparent that the same tactics used to get the Russian people to conform are now being used on the American people. Benjamin Franklin stated it very clearly when he said, quote, We must all hang together, or we will surely hang separately. Unquote. We Americans should feel very fortunate to have had those who laid their very lives on the line to secure liberty for us and give us a constitution as a protection from tyranny. We must not allow their great sacrifice to have been made in vain by allowing these public servants, who, we are beginning to find out, have not even taken the proper oath of office which they legally need to have taken to be officially recognized as lawful public servants. If enough Americans will wake up to what is going on and order their public servants, members of Congress, member of for and by the people, to obey the written laws of this land and perform the duties which they swore to uphold and are being paid to uphold, and that such failure on their part is more than ample cause for the termination of their job. Wake up, Americans. Know your rights while there is still time to stop this travesty upon the laws of this great nation. If you would like more information on what you heard tonight, write to The Pilot Connection, 6333 Pacific Avenue. Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207. That's The Pilot Connection, 6333 Pacific Avenue, Suite 334, Stockton, California, 95207 or call area code 209-957-5493. That's 209-957-5493. Make sure you tell them that you heard about the pilot connection on the hour of the time. Also tell them that William Cooper sent you. Now, for those of you who are out there who are still stupid, who are saying, "Oh, oh, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna teach these people to disobey the law and not pay their taxes," that is not true. If you want to pay your taxes, pay them. As you heard on the last broadcast and on this, income taxes are strictly voluntary under the law, and you've heard the law quoted. I do not ever advocate anyone to go against the law. I will tell you, do not ever go against the law. Do what is legal in all cases. The Pilot Connection will teach you what the law really is and how to do whatever you want to do once you've made your decision. And that's the truth. 
of the matter. The pilot connection will also tell you, don't disobey the law. Don't go against the law. Don't ever try to overthrow the government of the United States of America. None of us advocate that. On the contrary, our purpose is to save the United States of America, to save the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and to do what is legal. Remember, many people are caught in traps of their own making because they are stupid, they do not do the necessary research to find out what the law really is, and they are afraid to stand up for what they know is right and to claim their rights given to them by the Constitution and by their Creator. I hope you've learned something in the last broadcast and in this broadcast tonight. As always, good night, and God bless you all.